Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to start a new series this morning. And I, all I want to do this morning is introduce the series and kind of give you a little background information. Um, but we also have some church business that needs to be taken care of. So this morning I'm going to intro the series and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the stuff going on at church that you need to be aware of. Um, how many people in here, when you came to salvation or at any point thereafter, um, actually were discipled, that you went to a discipleship class? How many people actually entered into a discipleship? Go ahead and put them up so I can see. Okay, okay. So, so a little less than half, okay. And I find this interesting because um, I don't know at what point the church transitioned, but at some point in the history of the church, we transitioned from making disciples. We, everybody knows the Great Commission, right? Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations preaching unto every living thing and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's the Great Commission. That's the charge <coughs> that he has left for the church to do. That's the task. Okay, But somewhere along the way, we took out to make disciples and we contented ourselves with making converts. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Both are necessary. And yet one has a much deeper involvement on behalf of the church than the other. Because see, when you're a convert, if you're out making converts, all you're really looking for is an answer. You want them to give the right response. And yet, Jesus didn't call us to make converts. He called us to make disciples. Okay? And... and um, does anybody know what uh, a disciple is? See, we, have, we, we need to establish certain things so that when I say a word, you understand exactly what I'm meaning by using that word. Okay? Now, in, in the Greek, the word that they used, I'm, I'm going to read it here, methetis, and strictly interpreted, that means a student or a pupil. But at this time, a little bit of history for you, um, about 300 AD, we know that uh, the Israel was conquered by Alexander. Um, we know that uh, one of the things that Alexander brought when he conquered a nation was that he brought Hellenism. He brought Western thinking to those, those places that he conquered. And that included their, their philosophies, their culture, their gods, their, their way of living. And it was called the process of Hellenization. Okay? And, and at some point at that period, up to that point, the discipling of children was given into the care primarily of the family. <coughs> Typically, the fathers. If a father was not present, then an uncle. But at some point in here, up until the birth of Christ, the, there started to be a transition in Jewish culture and Jewish thinking. And they saw the, the encroachment on their culture of, of the, the Western thinking, and, and they started to get concerned that the, the pure belief of Judaism was being tainted by this Hellenization. And so they, they devised this thing, and I believe it actually happened while they were uh, actually in exile some 200 years earlier. I think the seeds were planted some 200 years earlier. Um, <coughs> families started putting their children to school with respected rabbis, and rabbi just means teacher, okay? And, and, but at this period with Hellenization, we know that families, for the purity of the teaching, sought out rabbis for their, their children to learn under. And, and they learned up until about the age of 12. And then at 12, it was decided what they were going to do with their life. Were they going to pursue their family's occupation? Were they going to pursue some other sort of occupation? Were they going to go on and study the Word and become a rabbi themselves and, and maybe a, a teacher or a scribe? 
And so at the age of 12, that was a significant event in their lives. Now, typically what would happen would be at the age of 12, when it was decided that they were going to pursue studying the, the Hebrew Bible, they would begin, their family would begin to seek out a respected rabbi for them to disciple under. And, and so this, this idea comes about that discipleship is not just being a student. Because what you would do is you would study and live underneath the teaching of this particular rabbi and you would become a little version of that rabbi. And so you were to emulate how they lived, the things that they taught, how they interpreted scripture. And, and so it wasn't just an idea that you're a student, but it was that you were an adherent. You were knitting yourself into the teaching. Okay? So, so it's not like this idea, well, okay, you know, we have uh, a student at kindergarten, and we have a student in 12th grade, and we have a student in college, and we're just one of those somewhere on the, 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 the spectrum of our walk. We're, we're somewhere in there. I might be a 7th grade student, and, and Gordy might be a junior in college student. Yeah, but that's not really what this idea is conveying. The idea that is being conveyed is that you are knitting yourself into and becoming like your teacher. Okay? And so this idea of discipleship, the idea that we're presenting today is this process where you learn to be like your teacher. Now, before I go further... Let me add this caveat. I don't want you to be like me. Okay? I want you to be like Christ. And, and even as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The focus should always be on him, not the particular teacher. Okay? So it, it's not about me. It's not really even about you. It's about him. Okay, so this process of discipleship is coming to know who he is and building relationship with him so that you might emulate who he is to be Christ-like. Okay, so when people look at you, they should see a reflection of Jesus. So, I want to give you a little bit more background because when we are disciples... We are to emulate Jesus, but Jesus did not do like the other rabbis did. Because see, the, the tradition was, um, we know from Paul, Paul grew up in Tarsus and uh, Cilicia. If you look on a modern map, you look at the Mediterranean, over in the, the northeast corner where it makes that big bend and comes down. Right before you get to that bend, that's the area of Cilicia, and Tarsus is up in that area. Okay? But we know that he was... Uh, of, the, of the tribe of Benjamin. We know that he studied diligently. We know that at some point, his family was in a position to be able to send him to Jerusalem so that he could, um, could study and disciple under Gamaliel, who was a respected teacher. As a matter of fact, he's still considered a very respected teacher of the law. Okay? But the idea was that they had to pursue this rabbi and, and, and request that this rabbi would train them. And obviously you wanted to get under a well-respected rabbi. You know, if you couldn't take A, then you wanted B, but you sure as heck didn't want to go down to C. Although if C was the only option, that's still better than nothing. But Jesus didn't follow these rules. Jesus didn't go this route. Because we know when Jesus set up for his disciples... They didn't come to him. He went to them. He turned this thing completely upside down. And if you watch and you study the life of Christ, you'll notice that he had a habit of doing that. He did things upside down because we're, we're so ingrained, we're, we're so caught up in this wretched world that first we don't really even see a, a lot of times what makes it wretched. We see some of the obvious things, but, but a lot of times... Uh, we look at things and accept them as normal that God utterly rejects. And so when you come to Christ, um, you know, he, he 
Tantra, I like to picture it like there's this kaleidoscope. And we spent our entire lives looking through this kaleidoscope so that everything looks right to us because that's all we've ever known. And when you come to Christ, he takes that kaleidoscope and he twists it. And he turns it so everything is as it should be. Because God understands reality better than we do. Okay? And that's, that's where faith comes in. Because we look at what we think is real and we go, oh my goodness. And God says, no, this is what is real. And by faith we stand on that until that's proven true. Okay? But God twists this, this kaleidoscope until everything comes into its right alignment. But it looks weird to us. You know, it doesn't look right to us because we're not used to it. And, and so there's certain things that, that we stumble over because, wow, I remember my brother-in-law, I had very bad eyesight, and it was a, uh, a year or so after he married my sister. And uh, she finally talked him into going to the eye doctor, and he got glasses. And he walked outside, and he was shocked because he didn't realize you could see individual leaves on a tree. That just blew his mind. Hey, whenever he looked at a tree, he just saw a blob of color on the top and the tree, and, and that's just the way it was. But when you walked outside, and you could see the leaves actually moving in the wind. He, he was just amazed. And, and that's kind of the idea, is that God is, is correcting our vision, correcting our thinking, so that it is in line with His, so that we would know truth. And sometimes our flesh just, just kind of recoils and says, that looks weird. Okay? Discipleship is this process whereby we learn what truth is. And, and we learn to accept God's truth. We learn to reject those things that are not true. And in this process, as we become intimate with Him, we become more and more like Him. Uh, I read a thing the other day that it says that, that your personality is the sum total of your five closest friends. Okay? Your five closest friends have that much influence on you or you pick your five closest friends such that you emulate that behavior. Okay? Um, which is why it's very important how you pick your friends. Okay? Because they, they exert a significant amount of influence over you whether you realize it or not. Is it okay if I turn this fan off? All right, yeah. you good? Thank you. So, discipleship. Jesus went out <coughs> And how many disciples did Jesus have? Lots. Lots. Everybody uh, calls back and they go, oh, there's 12 disciples. Well, no, actually. There were lots of disciples. At some point, there were even thousands of disciples. But of those, th that great number, he chose 12 to be apostles. Okay, so uh, apostles is different than disciple. A disciple is someone that is an adherent to their teacher or their teacher's their thinking, their, their teaching. But a, a, an apostle is somebody that is sent out to, to go out and carry the message that the teacher gives. Okay, so there were thousands of disciples, but there were only 12 apostles. Now, the apostles were also disciples. Okay, they were those that, that laid down what they were doing. I mean, you, you think about uh, James and John. They're out on the fishing boat with their dad. And actually, it, the, the, it boats, there was plural. And Jesus comes and he calls to them. And he's already got Peter and Andrew and he calls to them and says, come. And they lay down their nets and they go. I, I always wonder, what was their dad thinking? <laughs> I, d doesn't that just seem weird? They would just drop everything and go? Um, but they did. And so, um, Jesus goes out and he, he calls a, a certain number and then there are those that, that come because of the things that he's done and the things that he's teaching and they choose to follow him. We know that when he went down to Jerusalem uh, before the crucifixion, that, that we know that the twelve were with them, but we know that there were others because it says there were a large group of women that came with him. Okay? And, and we know that there were others that were in the upper room uh, when, when uh, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And it doesn't say anything about them you know, drawing more in. As a matter of fact, if anything, it says that they scattered out. So, so we know that there was a large number of disciples that followed Jesus. Okay? So, 
discipleship, when I'm talking about being a disciple, I'm talking about being a dedicated, devoted follower or adherent to Jesus Christ and His teaching. <coughs> All right? So, so we've got to start from that premise. Okay? Now this starts at conversion. So see that being a convert is necessary because you, you have to go through that process whereby you surrender the, the rights and the authority of, of your life to His Lordship. You accept Him not only as your Savior, but you acknowledge Him as your Lord. He, you acknowledge that He has the authority to tell you to go, and you go. Okay? And, and that's part of the problem in the church today. We have a lot of converts that want Jesus Christ as Savior because they don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. But... We don't have that many that have embraced Him as Lord and have committed themselves to being His disciple, to being underneath Him and allowing Him to dictate what they're going to do, how they're going to live, how they're going to think, and, and what they're going to reflect to the people around them. Okay? So we have a lot of people that at some point prayed a prayer. It's like the, the sower of the seeds. There's a lot of people that, that at some point either grew up and had no root and withered in the sun or they grew up among the weeds and the weeds choked them out and yet at each process they looked like all the other seed. The seed that was snatched up looked like the seed that was sown in good soil. The, the, the plant that grew up in the rocks and had no root looks like, at that point, it looked like the plant that was growing up in the good soil. The one that grew up among the weeds looked identical to the one that was growing up in the soil. The problem is, only the one that grew up in the soil endured and reproduced after its kind. So we have a lot of people in the church today that have no root. And part of that, I, I absolutely believe, is the church's fault. Because we have not discipled. We have... We have uh, it's kind of the same idea as, as pro-lifers. Um, actually, most pro-lifers aren't pro-lifers, they're pro-birthers. Okay, do you understand that? Because a pro-lifer is somebody that is going to be committed to the life of the child, not just the child's birth. They're going to be committed to making sure that that child is taken care of. If necessary, that that child is put into a good home. We have over a million abortions committed in this, year, in this country every year. Can you imagine what would happen to the adoption agencies if there were a million children in one year to flood the adoption agency? Would you be willing to adopt? Because if you're not committed to helping out with the life of the child, you're just a pro-birther. Okay? And it's the same way, that same idea follows in to our salvation if, if you're not committed to surrendering yourself in total, absolutely all of it, then you're like one of these other plants. You're either the, the one in the, the rocks and you have no root, or, or you're like the one in the weeds and the cares and the concerns of this life and the, the desire for wealth chokes, chokes you out. Okay? So, discipleship. <clears throat> I want to start off with uh, the call. Okay? Because the first thing that Jesus did when He went to the disciples is He called them. As a matter of fact, He still called. And He sent His Holy Spirit into this world that that call might reach all men. And His Holy Spirit has gone into the world to convict men of their sins so that they would recognize their need for a Savior. Okay? So at the very start of His ministry, Jesus called. And we know He called Peter and Andrew and James and John and, and Matthew or, or Levi. And, and we know that He called these men. And, and they came and they followed Him. So first, there's this call that goes out. And... Um, Mark 3.14 says that he appointed 12 of these, these disciples 
whom he named apostles, so that they might be with him, and that he could send them. So that the first idea here is when Jesus calls you, he's calling you to be with him. So that he can send you. Okay? It's, it's this idea um, that, that uh, right now we, we have a new president that's been in office for about three months. And he's going through and he's filling out the positions in his government. And, and he's establishing uh, who will serve at what position. Part of that process is that he has to uh, appoint ambassadors. And those ambassadors then go and represent his policy, his politic, to other nations. So first there is this call, ringy dingy, and he calls a particular person and, and says, would you be interested in serving as ambassador to X country? Okay, now the person on the receiving end has to receive the call, correct? But not only do they have to receive the call, they, they have to engage. I mean, you know, the, when your phone rings, you have a choice whether or not to answer it. Unless, of course, your wife answers it and then hands it to you. So they, they have to respond, and then there's this call, would you, will you, and then there's got to be a response. Okay? And, and there has to be an agreement. <coughs> There has to be a, a, a willingness to work together. Now, in this, this illustration, who's the boss? The president. The one making the call is the boss. Because he's the one that gets to dictate the terms of, of what the callee is going to be doing. Now, um, when we come to Christ, it's that same thing. It's his rules. He, he makes the call, we respond, we don't get to barter. Okay? We don't get to come to him and say, okay, I'm willing to give you 95% of my mess, but I want to keep this 5% back for myself. Because, see, the call, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when, when Christ bids a man come, he bids him come and die. Okay? So when, when we are responding to the call, we have to understand that it is a life-ending event. <coughs> okay? It's not life-changing, it's life-ending. Because the person that you were before you resp responded to that call is dead and buried. And then we are resurrected into new life, a new creation that willingly subjects itself who Patasso submits. <coughs> we submit to his authority. So Jesus puts out this call. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 9 says, God, who called us into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. There's two things that I want to draw your attention to in that one little verse. It says, God who has called. So, so God is the initiator. God is the one that is, is sending out a call. Okay? And what is he calling us to? He is calling us into fellowship, koinonia, with Jesus Christ. He is calling us to come together with Jesus Christ. Uh, one other verse that I want to read here real quick, Philippians 3.10. This is Paul speaking, and, and uh, even though he is speaking this from his person, I believe that God included this in Scripture because this needs to be us. This needs to be our heart. Uh, Paul says, My aim is to know Him, to experience the power of His resurrection. That's great, isn't it? We, we like that part. To experience the power of His resurrection. But then he goes on. You know, if he would have just put a period right there, that would have been great. But he did. Comma. To share in his sufferings. And to be like him in his death. 
verse 11, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. See, this is this idea that in order to have fellowship with Jesus, he's calling you into his life, the example that he set. And, and that life is that in, in this life, we, we may suffer. That's, that's considering the cost. It's one of those things that I absolutely despise about most altar calls. Most altar calls are built on an emotional response to a particular event. But Jesus doesn't call us to have an emotional response to a particular event. He calls us to consider the cost. <coughs> that we would go into this with eyes wide open. We would understand what the nature of this relationship is going to be. Because Jesus says, hey, if you want to come after me, you've got to pick up your cross and you've got to carry it. And, and we, we, we look at that in different eyes because to us, the cross is an emblem of victory. That's, that's like the totem of our faith. Our faith is built on the cross. But at that time when he's talking about that, it, he's asking them to take up a, you know, a, you can follow me, to come and take up your electric chair. Take up your hangman's knot. He's, he's, he's asking them to do something that is abhorrent to them. And then follow me. And so we have to understand that first there's this call that goes out, and this call is come and be like I am. Okay? And, and yet he, he did not love his own life so much, that, that, but he gave it up. Okay? And, and in return, see the process of becoming a Christian is very simple. It requires a measure of faith whereby you simply acknowledge that what God says is true. And what's really cool about that is without God, you couldn't even have that faith. So, so God gives you the faith to be able to acknowledge, to accept. Okay, But the process of becoming a, a Christian, that, that walk of holiness that we've been talking about, that process of sanctification, that's hard. Because it, it is a constant self-denial. It is a constant giving up yourself to embrace and take on what he has, what he desires, what he wants. Okay, so as we get into discipleship, we're going to talk about, uh, today we just talked about the call. Okay, when, when Jesus called his disciples, and he's still calling us, he's un, unlike any other rabbi throughout history. Whereas most rabbis would sit and wait for somebody to come and, and make their case as to why they should, he should allow them to be his disciple. Jesus has come to us. And he has called us. And his voice is ringing out throughout the world today saying, come and follow me. Okay, but we're going to get into this because there's a lot packaged up into this idea of discipleship. And I want to encourage you. If you have not been in a discipleship class, if you have not been through a class that teaches you the, the elements of faith, the, the basic elements of our faith and, and the teachings, then I would encourage you, find somebody to get with that can disciple you. Find somebody that is learned and is mature in their faith and can walk you through the process so that you would understand exactly what it is that this faith is all about. I'm going to close there today because there's a couple of things that we need to address as far as business in the church. Uh, those of you that were in the... Uh, business meeting have, have heard this uh, but we've come to the point now where it needs to be addressed before the church um, so I'm going to close in prayer and we're going to move on to business Father I thank you God that your voice is still calling out today that your voice is going out to all people and I thank you Father that we have heard and we have responded and Father, I ask, Lord God, that you would make us disciples worthy of you. People that would hunger and thirst for you. Father, that we would dedicate ourselves to knowing you more fully. To studying your word. To being in fellowship one with another. To spending time with you throughout our day. God, that we might hear and know your voice. That we might be quick to follow your will. We bless you this morning and we thank you in Jesus' name.
So.